needles in your hand You will not find hope with that needle in your vein There is no life in the wicked lies that fill your brain All you need is found in Jesus Surrender to the love of Jesus Put your faith in only Jesus All right, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Could you uh, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. You should have my translation in front of you of uh, 2 Timothy. And also, I had uh, Tyler and Cheyenne pass out uh, my complete translation of 1 Timothy and Titus. We'll probably be, re we'll be referring to those two books here this evening because uh, as related to this, uh, uh, this line in, in verse 11 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, it's a trustworthy statement. We're going to be talking about uh, what that means here, and uh, because it's used quite a bit in the pastoral epistles, 1 first first Timothy and Titus and 2 Timothy as well. So uh, we're going to look at verse, uh, begin to look at verse 11. Uh, we, we saw last evening, we looked at the whole passage, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13, which we saw was a hymn written by Paul that was sung in the early church. It's a portion of lyrics to a song in the church that the, the, the first century church would sing in their services. So we were talking about that whole, those three verses last evening in detail. Now we're starting to break out uh, each one of these verses. And so what we're going to do tonight is look at the very first line of verse 11, 2 Timothy 2.11. It's a trustworthy statement and how that applies to the statements in verses 11, 12, and 13. And we see that this very same line there, it's a trustworthy statement, 
is found in 1 Timothy. It's found t- twice there, and it's also, actually three times, and it's also found in, in Titus as well, when we studied that book on our Sunday classes in the past year. So it's very significant in Paul's writings. It's, uh, we're going to talk about what that means when he uses this phrase, it's a trustworthy statement, uh, because it, uh, it's, it's aff- affirming uh, the inspiration of what Paul wrote. Uh, one of the things it's doing. So let's take a moment of silent prayer as is our custom. Uh, We do this to examine ourselves, give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to convict us of any sin that we might have committed since our last confession. Uh, When we confess our sins, we're restored to fellowship, as it says in 1 John 1, 9. We maintain this fellowship uh, after we confess our sins. We maintain that fellowship simply by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God. When we're doing that, we're not only uh, obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, but also the, uh, Colossians 3.16, that command there where it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in your soul. The reason why they're uh, the exact same thing, even though uh, one's emphasizing the Spirit, one's emphasizing the word, is because 2 Peter 1.20 20 and 21 says that the Holy Spirit inspired the Scriptures. So to obey the word of God is to obey the Holy Spirit because he's the one, the member of the Trinity, that has inspired the human authors to write down what they did and perfect accuracy in the original languages of Scripture. Now, if there's anything that's disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us, not only to enjoy creation, but to have fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Bible, the completed canon of Scripture, and we thank you, Father, for the things that we've been studying in 2 Timothy here during our weekday classes. Father, we thank you for our union and identification with your Son, which gives us the victory uh, positionally over sin and Satan, and we can experience that victory by appropriating by faith that position in Christ and considering ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to you because we've died with Christ and we're raised with your son to new life. So help us to reflect uh, who we are in Christ. Help us and motivate us and encourage us, rebuke us, reprove us if necessary. We thank you for your rod and your staff and disciplining us and getting us back on track when we get off track. We thank you, Father, for all the, the blessings of our relationship with you and the the guarantee of a resurrection body in the future. And uh, even if we were to die before the rapture, we know that we'd be absent from the body face-to-face with your Son, Jesus Christ. We also know that we can get rewards if we're faithful. So help us to be faithful in this life, to arrange our priorities so that you were first, and particular particular obedience to your word is first in our, our priorities. And we just thank you, Father, for... Uh, everyone that is here this evening, not only here in the Thompson home, but also those who are viewing or listening to this class live right now through our uh, website or at a later date through the recordings on our website. We thank you for each and every one of them. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson opening up their home to us and their hospitality. We also, uh, we also thank you for Titus and Tyler, his son, working with the sound and the recordings and the technology that you've given to us, which we thank you for. Uh, we just pray that you give them wisdom in that area uh, of service here this evening. Uh, we also pray that you would help everyone who is in the audience. To We pray that the Holy Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through the audience. Uh, we pray that the Holy Spirit would give us conviction, uh, reprove us, rebu- rebuke us if necessary, encourage us, and instruct us in righteousness, Father. 
because we know that that's what the Spirit does through your word. So we pray he would do a mighty work here this evening uh, through the audience. We also pray that you would do a mighty work through the communicators so that your full counsel is brought forth from this pulpit with accuracy and clarity, reverence and respect and power so that your people are built up and edified spiritually and that you and your son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified. So Father, we pray for this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, and I'm going to read starting off uh, from the New American Standard. It, it says in verse 11, it's a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Uh, the Net Bible, which is an excellent translation, I would definitely recommend it, uh, because it has fantastic notes and gives you insight into how the translators came up with their translation, among other things. They translate these verses, this saying is, a tr is trustworthy. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains unfaithful, since he cannot deny himself. Now, in my translation of those very same verses, uh, we have the following, if you bear with me on that. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, if I can get it, here we go. This statement is, as an eternal spiritual truth, trustworthy, namely, if and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument that each and every one of us has died with Christ, then we all agree this is true, and of course, the reason why is because Paul taught them this, then each and every one of us, as a certainty, will also in the future live with him. If and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument that any of us endures, then we will indeed certainly reign with him. Speaking of being rewarded for faithfulness. If and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, any of us refuses to follow him. Apostasy, unfaithfulness. Then he also will in fact certainly refuse us. And that is of course rewards. He will refuse to allow us to reign with him. We're in his kingdom, but we won't be in his government, serving in his government as rulers. If and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument that any of us is unfaithful, he continues to remain faithful because he is, as an eternal spiritual truth, never able to be untrue to himself. And that's what we call a hymn uh, that uh, in those verses. And this was a, a, a snippet of a song that was sung in the early church and their service. Now, in verse 11, as we've read from my translation, the Net Bible and the New American Standard, we have Paul is actually employing the figure of a syndeton, meaning there's no connective word between the last statement in verse 10 and this first statement here in verse 11. And the reason why he's doing it here, there's a number of reasons why they do this. If this is found in English, this figure. It's here, it's to uh, emphasize the solemn nature of what Paul's saying here and verses 11 through 13. So Paul's using this figure, meaning he's not using a connective word between his previous statement in verse 10 and his statement here in verse 11. Now this figure is to emphasize how solemn this, this, these verses are, verses 11 through 13, which I'll call a hymn. And he's emphasizing with this figure the solemn nature and in relation to his statements in verses 8 through 10. So if you actually look at, uh, and I'll uh, read for the New American Standard. If you look at verses 8 through 10, they're actually related to what Paul is saying in verses 11 through 13. Verse 8 says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which gospel I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. Now Paul's giving himself as an example of faithfulness despite the undeserved suffering. This, that, that, so what he's saying there is related to the hymn. It's also related, the hymn in verses 11 through 13, is also related to the first seven verses in the chapter. Look at verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, the things which you have heard from me, and the presence of many witnesses, and trust these the faithful men, who will be able to also teach others. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. 
Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So what he's saying there to Timothy to encourage him to persevere despite undeserved suffering and adversity Timothy was facing, he, he's applying that, 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 that hymn in verses 11 13, through 13 to Timothy's situation. Both Paul's situation in Rome, imprisonment, while in prison, awaiting his execution, and t the statements to Timothy to encourage him to continue to be faithful to the gospel despite the adversity and undeserved suffering, the hymn is directly related to both of these men in their situation. It's also directly related to us as Christians. It's applicable to us. Because if you look at verse 11, it says in verse 11, it's a trustworthy statement. For if we have died with Christ, positional truth, we also will live with him. I mean, that's a guarantee of a resurrection body. So what he's saying there is an encouragement to Timothy and Paul that even if they get executed and killed by the Roman authorities, they're going to get a resurrection body. They're going to live with Christ. They got the victory over death. That's true of us as well. Because at the moment of salvation, the moment we believe in Jesus, we are identified with Jesus and his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father. So before we became Christians, we were in Adam under a curse. Uh, we were all sinners by nature and practice. When we trusted in Jesus, now you have a new identity. Your identity is not with the old creation under the old, uh, under the Adam, the first Adam. It's now with the, with the new creation under the headship of Jesus Christ, a place of blessing. So you are already blessed, already, from eternity past. So now, because you've died with Christ, the Bible says, that means God views you as having died with Christ 2,000 years ago, and now he considers you also to be raised with Christ. So now, that promise of a resurrection body becomes very real. It's, a, a re, it's going to be a reality. It's a guarantee. So no, if we die... We don't have to worry about that. We're going to live with God forever. Remember, Jesus said, He who believes in me, even if he dies, he shall live. So we might be absent from these bodies, these, these bodies that are contaminated by the sin nature, but we will still live on, and we'll eventually get that resurrection body. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy and himself by what he's saying in that statement there. And it should be an encouragement to all of us. Then he says, if we endure meaning persevere despite our hardships and adversity that we face, we will also reign with him. We'll reward, be rewarded with Jesus Christ. And we'll be rewarded and we'll be serving in his kingdom and have authority over the nations that will be around during the millennial kingdom. So that's a great motivation. So he's trying to motivate Timothy, and he would motivate himself with this statement, saying, I'm going to continue to persevere till death or the rapture so I could be rewarded with the position of reigning in Jesus Christ's government, his millennial government. So that should be an encouragement to us that to persevere. It should be a motivation and an encouragement to persevere, learn God's word, put it into practice in our daily life. Don't let anything take you away from doing that because it has a rich reward. It has eternal consequences. So he's, he's, this applies to us as well. Then he says, if we deny him, meaning refuse to follow him, he will also deny us, refuse us rewards. He, we will not get rewarded and we'll, we'll forfeit rewards because of our unfaithfulness. And then, it says in verse 13, if we are faithless, unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So there's an assurance there in verse 13 that if you decide you're going to be unfaithful in this life, you're not going to lose your salvation because to do that would be to deny himself so you re he remains faithful to us, despite our unfaithfulness. So all of this, that would be serve as an, an assurance to Paul, to Timothy, to us. It should serve as an assurance there. Uh, the, uh, the warning in, in verse 12, if we refuse to follow Jesus, he will also refuse us rewards. That's a warning to us. If we endure, if we persevere in this life, we will also reign with Christ. That's an encouragement, a motivation to persevere. And then... If we've died with him, we will also live with him. That's an assurance, an encouragement that this, even if we die physically, leave these bodies, we're going to live with God forever. We have the victory through Jesus' death and resurrection over physical death. 
So all of these things apply to Timothy and Paul and their situations. They're, these statements are tied to what Paul said to Timothy in the first seven verses and what Paul's saying about himself as an example in verses 8 through 10. And they're also applicable to the church. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, as we read, Paul was exhorting Timothy to remain faithful to the gospel in the face of undeserved suffering, just like he was doing when he penned this epistle. In verses 11 through 13, we read, he's teaching Timothy that he'll be rewarded for faithful service, but will not be rewarded for unfaithful service. But even if he's unfaithful, the Lord says he will never lose his salvation. Therefore, in 2 Timothy 2.11, Paul employs this figure of ascendaton because he wants Timothy to understand the eternal implications of remaining faithful to the gospel in the face of persecution and under, undeserved suffering. He wants him to understand the, inter, the eternal implications for not remaining faithful to the gospel. Or in other words, this figure emphasizes how serious Paul viewed his teaching in 2 Timothy 2, 8-11. So when we teach this as pastors, this is serious business. I know we have the things of the world are serious. We have responsibilities. You know, there's political issues that we face, social issues, uh, economic issues, all these things that were surrounding us. They're all context, people. This is the thing that should drive us. If we do that, everything else will fall into place for us. We have to put the spiritual ahead of the, the natural, the temporal. Because the spiritual has eternal uh, ramifications. The temporal, that's transitory. These things will go away. Political situations change. Economic situations change. Uh, the uh, social, uh, uh, social situ issues change. But the eternal spiritual things, those are the things that never change. So he's saying this. What he's Paul, the Holy Spirit, saying to us in these verses, in 11, verses eleven through thirteen, is applicable to the church and the pastor, the pastor and his congregation. Every single thing that Paul's saying here is to get, is to motivate and encourage and warn Timothy to remain faithful and keep going. And we should bear the, bear uh, heed the warning that, and the and the encouragement, and uh, it, it, this, that we should arrange our priorities accordingly. So that's one of the big things we need to do and we need to ask God to do that because some decisions that we make in life are very, very difficult because of the pressure of the world and whatnot. So we need God's help, obviously, to make those tough decisions. Now, it's interesting. This, this, I want to emphasize this evening, the very first line there, as I said earlier in verse 11, it's a trustworthy statement. That's found in 1 Timothy, a couple of times, it's found in Titus. We studied both of those books in detail, and we now see it in 2 Timothy. It's a very significant expression in the pastoral epistles. The expression in the Greek is pistos hologos. It appears five times in the pastoral epistles. Pastoral means it's a designation that Bible teachers give it for 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. They're called pastoral epistles because... They're related to the, uh, it talks, these epistles talk a lot about the duties of a pastor. That's why they're often called the pastoral epistles. Now, the first time we see this expression, pistos ho logos, it's a trustworthy statement. We see it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. So if you could, you should have my translation of 1 Timothy in front of you. And uh, if you could turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, in my translation, I emailed it out to our internet people, so hopefully they'll be able to post that. And you can find this, in your, you'll, you'll see the statement in your Bibles, I'll refer to it. In 1 Timothy 1, 15, in my translation, it says, This saying is as an eternal spiritual trustworthy. Indeed, worthy of full acceptance. What is that? Namely, that Christ, who is Jesus, entered the human race in order to save sinners, among whom I myself am the foremost. Uh, it says in the, in the New American Standard, and those, in that very same verse, if I may read from it, 
it goes as follows. It says, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that, and here it is, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. So in verse 15 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, that's, uh, this faithful saying is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world to save sinners. It's the heart of the gospel. It's an articulation. This phrase, it's a trustworthy statement, is saying that the phrase that Christ came into the world to save sinners is, a, is the heart of the gospel and that it's an articulation of the gospel as well as an expression of Paul's apostolic authority. It's designed to rebuke and refute those pastors in Ephesus at that time who sought to be teachers of the law and taught false doctrine rather than teaching the gospel. They misused and misinterpreted the purposes of the Mosaic law. So this phrase... It's a trustworthy statement. It's telling us that the phrase, Christ came into the world to save sinners, it's implicitly rejecting the law as the basis for eternal salvation and as the means of transforming the sinner into an obedient child and a servant of God. So again, we see the phrase, it's a trustworthy statement. It's saying, it's used in relation to the, uh, to the statement that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into the world to save sinners. It's, a, it's an articulation of the gospel. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Jump over there. Look at verse 1. We see this uh, line. It's a trustworthy statement. Pistos ho logos. We see it in 1 Timothy 3.1. It says in 1 Timothy 3.1 from my translation, this saying is, as an eternal spiritual truth, trustworthy. What's that? If and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument that any man at any time does aspire to the office of overseer for himself. And we agree that there are men who do. Then he, as an eternal spiritual truth, desires a noble occupation. Uh, the New American Standard, uh, they translate that very same verse. They go as follows. It's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires, now you, they see they put the colon there. So that's telling you the next line is what the trustworthy statement is. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. Uh, let me read from the, uh, the, uh, the Net Bible, that very same verse, to give you an idea. This saying is trustworthy. If some, someone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a good work. So, what is this? Uh, it, it's a trustworthy statement. Well, that's referring to this first class conditional statement that follows it, indicating that this statement is a commendation of the overseer office, uh, uh, the office of overseer. So this is designed to refute those who reject the authority of the overseer, the pastor, as a result of those pastors in Ephesus who are abusing their authority and teaching false doctrine. So uh, let me put it this way. And in, in when we read 1 Timothy, Paul was dealing, and Timothy were dealing with a situation where there were many pastors, Christian pastors in Ephesus, who were listening to the Judaizers and who emphasized the law. Now, the law isn't holy, righteous, and good. It's in the Bible. It's part of the Bible. But they were misusing it. They thought it was a means of salvation. It isn't. That's why you see Paul says, we're not saved by the works of the law, but we're saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. He says that in Galatians 2.16, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, famous passages. So he comes out and he's... So what's happening is the, the office of pastor, overseer, was being discredited by these, these false teachers, these apostate pastors. So Paul's saying now, he wants to affirm that the men who, the Christian men who desire to be pastors, who have the gift and want to be, have the, uh, hold the office of overseer, he wants to affirm with them that it's still a noble occupation despite the fact that it's being abused, this office, of pa overseer pastor by certain men in Ephesus who were pastors. So that's very important for us in our day and age because despite the fact if certain men mis abuse their authority and their pastors that do, uh, they're, who are uh, not living godly lives, that are living double lives, and uh, living in, 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 in immorality and drunkenness and drug abuse or whatnot, uh, that, that just because these men have failed in, our in, in apostasy, that doesn't mean that the gift is a pastor teacher in the office of overseer is discredited uh, it, or it's lost its uh, importance or its noble character. It's still the most noble job on the face of the earth, despite the fact that some men 
are being unfaithful in that position. And they'll be held accountable for that. They'll be under discipline from the Lord. And the church should discipline those type of men. Follow the rules of church discipline in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Uh, you won't see many pastors tell you that. Uh, because so many, many pastors are covering up them. They won't teach these things of church discipline because they don't want their congregation holding them accountable. So we're all to be held accountable. Everyone, not just me, all of you too. So he's saying here in 1 Timothy 3, 1, that just the, despite the fact that these, uh, these apostate pastors are abusing their authority and living ungodly lies and teaching false doctrine, the office of overseer is still a noble occupation. With this phrase, it's a trustworthy statement. He's saying it's a spirit-inspired evaluation of the office of overseer, affirming the office of overseer's value and implying its importance to the body of Christ. Now hop over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 8. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Actually, look at verse 6. We'll start there. Get it in context, what I want you. So verse 6 says, By you yourself regularly pointing out these things, Timothy, for the benefit of your spiritual brothers and sisters, you yourself will be excellently serving Christ who is Jesus. Specifically, by you yourself regularly instructing them by means of these words originating from the Christian faith. In other words, that which is accurate teaching, for you, which for your benefit you are adhering to. But you yourself continue making it your habit of rejecting worldly myths. Yes, old wives' tale at that. He's speaking of the false teaching of the, the Judaizers and the apostate pastors in Ephesus. Then he says, rather continue making it your habit of disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. Speaking of the pastor's character. Uh, always remember, uh, it, it's one thing that the man's teaching sound doctrine. And he's accurate in his teaching. He'd be a great teacher. But if his lifestyle is ungodly, that's, don't go to him. He's got to have both. Now, do I say, now, I'm sure, I'm, I'm not saying the pastor's sinless. Obviously, we're sinners saved by the grace of God. We make, we sin, we make in many ways, just like everybody else does. But he's talking about the whole tenor of the man's life got to be one. You know this guy's godly. So it, 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 the teaching and the character got to go together. Otherwise, the testimony of the man in the Christian community and his congregation and outside the Christian congregation will be hurt if he doesn't have a godly character to go with sound teaching. Verse 8 says, For you see, physical exercise is, as an eternal spiritual truth, beneficial for a short period of time. However, godliness is, as an eternal spiritual truth, beneficial throughout all the ages because it does, as an eternal spiritual truth, include the promise, which is experiencing life during this present lifetime, and in addition, as a certainty during the future. This saying is, as an eternal spiritual truth, trustworthy, indeed worthy of, of full acceptance. And so then, he go, then if you could look at the, the New American Standards translation of, of those verses, it's quite interesting. Let's look at that from their, their, that, their angle here. It says in verse 6, in point, 1 Timothy 4, 6, and pointing out these things to the brethren, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but discipline, a uh, godliness, excuse me, is profitable for all things, since it holds pro the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Then he says, it's a trustworthy statement. Same thing we saw in 1 Timothy 3 and also 1 Timothy 1.15. It's a trustworthy statement deserving, of full, accept for, for, deserving full acceptance. Now, in, uh, when he says this saying in 1 Timothy, he says uh, in 4, that refers to the adversative clause in verse 8 and not the following verse uh, 10 because it's indicated by the fact that verse 9 is grammatically independent of verse 10 the B part. Let, let me show you what I'm talking about. What he's saying here in 1 Timothy 4, you can get confused if you watch out. It says it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. What is? Is it the statement to follow? No. How do we know that? Because verse 9 is not connected grammatically in Greek to that verse. What's, what's it connected to? 
that bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things because it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. That's the trustworthy statement, the importance of godliness and the value of godliness, the, the eternal value of godliness. Now, one other passage I want to show you uh, where this phrase, it's a trustworthy statement, appears in the pastoral epistles. Let's go to Titus now, chapter 3. We studied that book as well as 1 Timothy in its entirety. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. And you should look at both my translation and your Bibles. I'm going to read from both. So I'm bringing you here because these verses, because 2 Timothy 2.11 has this line. It's a trustworthy statement, and it shows up in these passages in 1 Timothy. And now Titus chapter 3, I'm going to show you how it's used, and I'm going to show you how it's, what it's uh, saying in verse 11 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. So it's good to know how the thing is used, the phrase. So in Titus 3.1, and I'm going to read from my translation at this point, Titus 3.1, continue to make it your habit of reminding them, the Cretan Christian community, to make it their habit of voluntarily subjecting themselves to governmental rulers, or in other words, governmental authorities, by making it their habit of being obedient, to be ready for any kind of act which is divine good in quality and character. They're to be characterized as slandering absolutely no one, to be characterized as peaceable, magnanimous, with the result that together they show every consideration for each and every member of the human race. For we ourselves also at one time were existing in the state of being foolish ones, disobedient ones, deceived ones, those enslaved to various lusts as well as pleasures, continually spending our lives in malice as well as envy, hateful ones hating one another. But when the kindness, yes, the love for mankind, originating from the Savior, who is our God, was manifested. Sounds just like Ephesians 2, doesn't it? Same idea. Well, this is what you were before you became Christians. This is now who you are. Then he goes on to say, verse 5, He saved us by no means on the basis of meritorious actions as constituting our salvation source. In other words, on the basis of human self-righteousness, which we ourselves have done, but rather on the basis of his mercy as constituting the standard by means of a washing produced by regeneration, specifically a renovation produced by the Spirit who is holy, whom the Holy Spirit, he the Father, poured out upon us in full measure through Jesus who is the Christ our Savior. There's a Trinity verse right there. The divine purpose was accomplished so that we became heirs in order that we can confidently expect to experience eternal life because we've been justified by this, his grace. Then he says, this is, as an eternal spiritual truth, a trustworthy statement. Therefore, concerning these things, I myself always want you to discipline yourself and making it your habit of confidently communicating in order that those who have placed their absolute confidence in God would be intent on disciplining themselves and making it their habit of performing excellent works. These things are, as an eternal spiritual truth, excellent indeed beneficial for the human race. Uh, in verse, if I read verse 8 from uh, the New American Standard of chapter 3, it says, this is a trustworthy statement. What's the trustworthy statement is he referring to? Well, we see, before I answer that, we see here that Paul's informing Titus that his doctrinal statement in verses 4 through 7, which we read, is a trustworthy statement. That's what he's referring to. Uh, verses 4 through 7 are the trustworthy statement. What does the New American Standard have? The New American Standard has, let me read these verses from the New American Standard, verses 4 through 7, but when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, and by renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified, meaning accepted into God's family, by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the trustworthy statement. So you see quite a, ton, quite a bit. Uh, it's interesting. Have you noticed in 1 Timothy 1.15, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 4, we see in Titus, when it says it's a trustworthy statement, it's always referring to the preceding statement. Do you notice that? Anybody pick up on that? But when you get to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, it's referring, referring to the statements to follow. So it, 2 Timothy 2.11 is different 
that in the uh, usage of this phrase, it's a trustworthy statement, than the other verses that we've seen here this evening. So with this statement, he affirmed, Paul affirmed that his teaching in verses 4 through 7 was trustworthy regarding when the Christian was saved and the basis for their salvation, the means by which they were saved, as well as the purpose for which they are saved. And as a result of his doctrinal statement in verses 4 through 7, being trustworthy, Paul warned T Titus, as we saw, to continue disciplining himself and making it his habit of confidently communicating to the Cretan Christian community, not only his doctrinal statement in verses 4 through 7, but also the first three verses of the chapter. Now go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, with that brief survey of the line, whole pistos, pistos logos, it's a trustworthy statement. We've seen how it's used in 1 Timothy and in Titus, and it's always referring to the preceding statement. But when we get to 2 Timothy 2.11, as I said, it's referring to the verses to follow, clearly. So in 2 Timothy 2.11, it says, it's a trustworthy statement. Then, I think a lot of your translations will have the colon there. Uh, I know the New American Standard has that. Uh, th th does the, uh, they probably do too. Yeah, the, uh, the Net Bible does the same thing. In fact, the ESV does that too, Ch uh, Cheyenne. So the, Cheyenne's got the ESV. Uh, 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 it's a great, uh, great Bible as well, or, or a really good friend of hers. Uh, gave her that one time. We don't know who that was. But uh, that's a great, uh, e the ESV is a great, great Bible. And so is the, the NIV and the today's NIV. Uh, you know it's a good Bible too? It's the Good News Bible. is a pretty good translation too. But we see that they all use the colon here after the line. It's a trustworthy statement. And that means it's, it's getting, it's telling us that the trustworthy statement is what's to follow. So again, in 2 Timothy 2.11, it says it's a trustworthy statement. And what's that? Here it is. For if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So in 2 Timothy 2.11, the word Pistos, the word that's translated faithful or trustworthy, it's modifying the word logos, which is translated a statement there, and that refers to the statement that we just read in verses 11 through 13. Now, this word trustworthy, pistos, it expresses the idea that Paul's teaching in those verses, 11 through 13, is an accurate and faithful presentation of the gospel, or in other words, a faithful and accurate presentation of God's message to Timothy and the entire Christian community. So a lot of people get, uh, I, I've mentioned this in the past, when they think of salvation, they cookie cut the word. When they think of gospel, they cookie cut the word. We've seen in Romans, we've seen it all over Paul's writings. But the, the salvation is in three stages. Uh, positional, experiential, and perfective. Uh, positional, we entered into salvation through faith alone and Christ alone. That's, and that gives us the guarantee of living with God forever in a resurrection body at the rapture of the church. It also gives us the potential to experience that salvation now in time. The gospel, it's not just related to the unsaved. You know, if you believe in Jesus, the bad news is you're a sinner condemned before a holy God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners by nature and by practice. But the good news is that Jesus, the Son of God, became a human being, died on the cross, and was raised from the dead, and that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. That's good news for the unsaved because they were ready to hit eternal condemnation when they die. So they can avert the wrath of God forever by simple faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him as Savior. That's good news. But there's good news for the Christian. And it's not being said enough from the, from the pulpits. Paul spent chapters 6, 7, and 8 of the book of Romans talking about the gospel. Paul is talking about the gospel in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. That's the gospel too. Because look what is he talking about. Resurrection. Uh, we die with Christ. We're going to live with Christ. If we persevere, we'll get rewarded. That's good news for us Christians people. If we deny him, he will deny us, refuse us rewards. There's the warning. But that's a part of the gospel. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. We, could have, eternal, we have eternal security. That's good news for us. If we're unfaithful, we're still going to stay in God's family, but we're not going to get rewarded. Good news. So, when Paul says it's a trustworthy statement, the word trustworthy means that it's saying that that's a those verses are a faithful presentation of the gospel. They're an accurate expression of the uh, spirit-inspired apostolic teaching. So the adjective trustworthy, pistos, it pertains to the fact that this teaching, 
and verses 11 through 13 is worthy of trust or belief and is dependable and implies that it originates from God and is inspired by Him. You've heard me say this before. In this life, you can hang your hat on nothing. Trust me. Think about it. Well, my, my, my love for my wife, my wife's love for me, my, my husband's love for me, you know what? Eventually, we all get taken away from each other. I'm not being morbid, it's reality. But the and jobs can be taken away, money, we could lose that, we could lose health. I mean, we could be one day be in the best of health, the next thing it's gone. It's gone. What happened to my health? You know, you can't hang your hat on anything in this life. That's why Chuck, you heard me say well, last night with Chuck Swindoll, you know, his line was like, you know, don't hold on anything too long and too tight in this life because it gets taken away from you eventually or you get taken away from it. So what are we going to have? There's, people look for guarantees in life. You know, that's why uh, insurance is so big. You know, there ain't any guarantees in this life. We're looking for them. The only guarantee we could get, and Paul's saying that here, I'm giving you the guarantee you can hang your hat on what I just said. When he says it's a trustworthy statement, these statements in verses 11 through 13, and what he said in 1 Timothy and Titus that we read, he's saying you can hang your hat on each one of these things I've said. They're the truth. They're worthy of your trust. They're worthy of your obedience. They're worthy of your attention. And that so what's the application for us? The Bible. It's, it's worthy of our attention. It's worthy of our trust. It will never let you down. It will never let you down. I know you heard that, but it, you, and I've heard people say, well, you know, the, you know blah, blah, blah. You know, they, blame, they blame God and everything. It's like, yeah, yeah, look at it. You are a sinner and I'm a sinner. We let God down. So don't say God has let you down. That's, the, that's a condemnation of yourself because God can't let anybody down. He's faithful. He's God. He's perfectly faithful, perfectly loving. He still loves us even when we screw up bad. He's still there for us. We're the ones that got the problem. God has not failed us. We fail God. Because we don't want to take the time many times to learn and obey Him and see Him work in our lives if we obey Him. So God's saying uh, to Paul, I, I, you can hang your hat on my word. My word will never leave you or forsake you. It will never let you down. I'm not saying you're going to have a, a life that's going to be a highway because Paul, he's ready to get executed. But you don't hear Paul complaining about his situation or Timothy. It, what they're saying is, I'm going to trust God no matter what. He will never leave me or forsake me. As it says in Hebrews chapter 13, I will ne he will never leave you or forsake you. God's word will never let you down. And I could tell you, and you, many of you could tell me the same thing, that that's a true statement. I mean, the, I've been a Christian since I was 19. I didn't really get serious about the Bible until I was in my mid-20s. And I, since I've started, get, when I, since I, that time when I got serious about it, it's the best thing that ever happened in my life. It, cha it changed my life around. I'm not saying I've arrived or I'm, I'm uh, you know, this spiritual giant or anything, but it, the Word of God, is, it cleans up all the garbage in our head. It cleans up our lives. It gives us direction. It gives us, it's a lamp for our feet in the darkness of this world. It will never, ever, it'll never, ever let you down. We might misinterpret something or misapply something or not obey something, God's word is yet to let anybody down. You can count on it. And that's when he says, Paul says, it's a trustworthy statement. Every time he uses it, he's saying, listen to what I'm saying. You can hang your hat on it. So this word trustworthy is ascribed to Paul's teaching in verses 11 through 13, expressing the fact that it's in our, these verses are an articulation of the gospel as it well as an expression of Paul's apostolic authority. So this word pistos, faithful, it functions as what we call in Greek grammar a predicate nominative and uh, that means it's actually making an assertion about Paul's statements in verses 11, 13, 11 through 13, namely that they're trustworthy in the sense of being an accurate and faithful presentation of the gospel to the Christian community. And that means we should listen to these things. We should think about these things. Each, it's interesting, each one of these statements has the figure of a syndeton on it. I mean, there's no connective word between these, these four, four uh, uh, first-class conditional statements. 
That means that the writer wants you to think about each one of them individually and think about them when you read it. It wants you to think about these things and how they apply to you and me. So, therefore, we see that uh, this, uh, Paul's making an assertion about his teaching in verses 11, thir 11 through 13, namely, that this teaching is trustworthy in the sense of being an accurate and faithful presentation of the gospel to the Christian community, worthy of the Christian community's trust and obedience. Now, in 2 Timothy 2.11, the word statement there it, uh, is correctly translated. It means statement in the sense that this is a declaration or an assertion, and that declaration and assertion is found in verses 11 through 13. Therefore, the word statement, this is a trustworthy statement, the word statement is referring to Paul's doctrinal statement in verses 11 through 13. Now, uh, if you look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2.11, we're coming near the end here, it says, it is a trustworthy statement. It is, is does not translate a, a word in the Greek text, but the word in the Greek text is implied. It's the word emi. And that word means to possess a particular characteristic. And that characteristic is identified by the adjective pistos, trustworthy. This indicates that Paul's teaching in verses 11 through 13 possess the characteristic of being trustworthy. And the words in the present tense, and it's a gnomic present, used for a general timeless fact, and that would indicate that it's a spiritual axiom. It's an eternal spiritual truth that Paul's teaching in verses 11 through 13 is trustworthy. And then finally, if we look at this statement, it's a trustworthy statement. That line, it refers to Paul's doctrinal statement communicated in verses 11 through 13, and it expresses the idea that his teaching in these verses is an accurate and faithful presentation of the gospel. In other words, it's a faithful and accurate presentation of God's message to Timothy and the entire Christian community. It pertains to the fact that this teaching in these verses is worthy of trust or belief. It's dependable. It implies that it originates from God. It does all these things. It's inspired by Him. It's expressing the fact that it's an articulation of the gospel as well as an expression of Paul's apostolic authority. So, it's a trustworthy statement. It's coming from God. The Holy Spirit has inspired it. I'm an apostle. It expresses my authority. What I'm telling you and verses 11 through 13 is something that is very serious and solemn and we need to pay attention to it and make application. So if we look at each one of these as we wrap this up, this study, if we have died with him and we will also live with him. So that's giving us assurance and a confidence that even if we were to die, like Paul's about to be executed, we're going to live, we're live with him forever in a resurrection body. When he says it's a trustworthy statement, it's saying that that's a, that's a, you can hang your hat on that, as I said before. You can count on it. That's something you can, there's a guarantee from God, and nobody in this world can give you a guarantee like that. Only God can give you those guarantees in his word. Then he says in verse 12, if we endure, if we persevere, we will also reign with him. You know, it talks about, so when he says it's a trustworthy statement, he's saying when he says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. He's saying, again, it's worthy of your full acceptance and obedience and trust that you're going to get rewarded if you remain faithful. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 3. I'll show you another place where the uh, promise of, from Jesus of rewards if we're faithful. Look at Revelation. There's several passages I could take you to. Uh, let's see. The first one I want to show you is, let's see, uh, Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, no, Revelation 2, verse 18. I was looking at the wrong chapter. Revelation 2, 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds, he's speaking to a church in Thyatira, the Roman province of Asia, and your love and your faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, 
and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am the, he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. He's talking about disciplining members of the church who are involved in gross immorality there. This is Jesus talking. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold to this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Keep, the, keep persevering. Then look what he says. He who overcomes, and he who keeps my deeds, obeys me. Until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. There's a condition attached to it. Does everybody get, there's a Christian going to be in the kingdom? Anybody who's believed in Jesus and the church age is going in. It's the people who are faithful after their conversion, just like he says, they're going to be in the government reigning with him. Let me give you an example. Uh, in the, everybody is a citizen of the United States. Everybody who's an American citizen, we're all citizens of the United States. Everybody here in America, born in America, we're born American citizens. But is everybody in the government here in our country? No, there's a small portion that's in the government running things. Is it not? That's the way it's going to be in the millennial kingdom. The difference, though, is the ones who are going to be in the government of Jesus Christ, the millennial kingdom, you've got to remember, there's going to be nations all around the earth. So some of us, he said, will rule over ten cities, so you can have authority over the nations. And it, your decisions now in time are going to determine your rank in eternity. So this is the time to advance in rank by being faithful to God's word, and that's a wise person and a wise man and a wise woman that does that. Because we're looking, it takes faith in God's word to, to put your priorities in a, in a way that is, is going to enable you to get that reward of reigning with Jesus Christ. That's, that, so this is what we have here. We, look, at, uh, look at Revelation chapter 3. Verse 21. Revelation 3.21, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, on the Davidic throne, and it's going to be on the earth, just as I, as, I, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, which is in heaven. So he's promising believers. The condition is, if you overcome, you will get rewarded. You'll reign with me in my government. Sitting on a throne means you have authority over people. Governmental authority. Well, if you... That should be motivation, right? Well, Jesus didn't say it's a trustworthy statement. He doesn't need to say that, like Paul did in 2 Timothy 2.12, 2, that if we persevere, we will reign with Christ. But Jesus could say the same thing. It's a trustworthy statement, what I'm telling you. <laughs> that if you persevere, if you overcome, you will reign with me. It's a guarantee. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. It says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Then here's the next one, which is very often misinterpreted. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, some people use that line to say, oh, see, you could lose your salvation. But in context, what is he talking about? Rewards, is he not? He just got finished saying, if we endure, we'll also reign with him. And also... It says in verse 13, which is following the line, if we deny him, we will also, he will also deny us. It says in verse 13, if we are faithless, which we would be if we denied him, he remains faithful. Eternal security. For he cannot deny himself. So if we deny him, he will also deny us. The context is talking about refusing us rewards. Denying us rewards. And when Paul says it's a trustworthy statement in verse 11, he's saying you can count on that. That's a guarantee. You will be de denied rewards if you are not faithful. It's a warning. So let me show you this. Look at, uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. I think we were at this last night. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. Pretty much says, in different language, the same thing with Paul saying in 2 Timothy 2, 12, that... If we don't, you know, it, 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 we can lose rewards, but we're not going to lose our salvation. 
Big difference. We'll get rewards if we're faithful. We won't get rewards if we're not faithful. Here, in 1 Corinthians 11 through 15, uh, chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, he's talking about uh, we need to use God's power to, in order to get these, to perform good works that will be rewarded. So he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 11, For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each man's work will become evident for the day, and that's the day we stand before Christ at the Bema seat. The day will show up because it is to be revealed with fire, and the, that means judgment, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Quality, don't miss that. The gold, silver, and precious stones is divine. Speaking of the divine, wood, hay, and straw speaks of human power. We need to do things in God's power to get rewards. So it's not how much you do for God, it's the quality of your work that's everything. And how you do things in the Christian way of life. Are you doing things because of motivation from God's word? Or are you doing it because you're trying to gain the approbation of men and you want attention, you want people to applaud you, or are you doing it because of God's word says to do it and you're doing it and you're producing these things, these good works because of obedience to what the Spirit's telling you in the word of God. So look, he says then in verse, uh, verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Loss of what? Rewards. He, 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 he uh, clarifies. But he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. You lose rewards. Your good work, those works that you did in human power rather than the power of God's word, uh, they're going to be burned up. They're worthless to God. God can only accept that which is his, in his power, done in his power. So he's saying if the, even if your good work, the works you performed after your conversion are burned up because they're not divine in quality out of obedience from my word, you're still saved. You're still going to be with me. So there's going to be, two, there are going to be Christians that are, going to be, that are faithful in this life. They're going to get rewarded. They're going to be Christians that are not faithful. My job, so this is why you might say, oh, this guy, why is he so, just pounds, drives us, uh, you know, uh, drives us in our heads. Because I want the same thing for you that I want for myself. And I want the same thing for you that I want for myself. I don't want to see any of us have to stand before Christ and see this. Look at 1 John 2.28. A terrifying passage. I don't want to be embarrassed before, when I stand before the resurrected Christ and I find out I was, un, you know, I know I'm unfaithful and I have to stand for him. I don't want to face him if I'm, if I'm unfaithful. I want to be faithful. 1 John 2.28 Now little children, abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Now that's temporary shame and embarrassment, but it's going to be a reality for us if we're unfaithful in this life. I don't want you or me, anybody, any Christian, to have to face that. But there are going to be Christians that do. Why? Volition. You know, there's, you know the, the job of the pastor is to give out the truth and let the chips fall one way. I'm not going to, motive, I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm just going to tell you what it says. I'm going to, if whatever the word of God says, I'm going to communicate it to you. And what you do with it is your business. I can't make you believe what I believe. I can't give you the same convictions. I can't make you believe what I see and believe and, and teach. It's between you and God. But it says right there, little children, speaking of believers, abide in him. That means have fellowship with him. So that when he appears at the rapture, we may have confidence. And not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Now listen to me. If you have that, if you have shame right now, or you have conviction right now, then that's a, or that's a sign that God wants you to make some changes. If you're getting encouragement now, yeah, I can't wait to see him. Well, that's a confirmation that you're, you're doing, you're faithful now. So if he came back now, you're ready for him. I mean, this is, this is so funny. I get to the point in my life where I, I mean, you hear me say this, and I tell you this too, teach you this. I should keep short accounts with God. If I get at, make, think of, have a mental attitude, sin, I don't know, I get mad at Cheyenne, or I'm bitter toward her or something like that. I don't know. I'm not bitter to her. But if I, whatever the sin is, I confess it immediately because I, I don't want him coming. He could come back at any moment. I'd be like, Patrick, geez, I'm out of fellowship when he comes back. That's embarrassing. I, so the motivation is, we should always live in light of the fact that he could come back at any time. We also should live in light of the fact that, you know, if we, if we refuse to follow him in this life, 
there's consequences. It's a trustworthy statement that he will deny us rewards. Look back at 2 Timothy 2.13 and we'll close. Second Timothy 2.13, and he has the assurance of eternal security. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That too is a trustworthy statement. That is a clear articulation of the gospel as well. That's, a, that's something that we can hang our hat on. It's a guarantee. It's inspired by God. Now, it has the divine authority behind it. We're assured of our eternal security. Listen to me. There are a lot of Christians who think that they can lose their salvation. Let me ask you one question. Who, how did you, on whose merits did you get saved on in the first place? When you believed in Jesus Christ, you had faith in him. You, it, it, that's faith is non-meritorious. That means that the object of your faith, Jesus, saves you. Now, if you're saved on the merits of Christ and not of your own efforts, but on who he is and what he did for you at the cross, what in the world could you do after you're saved, after you're in his God's family, what sin could you possibly do that could cause you to have him disown you? Didn't King David, as a believer, commit adultery with Bathsheba? Yes. He murdered her husband. He had him killed on the battlefield. And then tried to cover it up. And then God sent the prophet Nathan, one of the bravest men in the history, sent him in to confront the king, which was a risky thing to do. And David humbly said, I'm, I'm the guilty man. Now under the law, he could have been executed. The law says an adulterer should be executed. But God said... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him reprieve. But he was disciplined severely for his actions as king. He was, the sword never left his home. There was, his family was a mess. Talk, so, talk about dysfunctional. The king's family was a mess right up to the day he was dead. He died. He paid the consequences. But he's still in God's family. King Saul. He was in great apostasy as the king of Israel. Once, once prophesied with the prophets of Israel, but he was in apostasy and sought to kill King David. A believer. He went to the witch of Endor at the end of his life. And, and he, yet he's with God today. In fact, Samuel said, this day, King Saul, and Saul, and Samuel was in paradise. This day you will be with me too, King Saul. Meaning you're going to die today on the battlefield, but you're going to come down with us, believers. Eternal security. Why is that? What about Peter? Peter, as a believer, denied the Lord three times. I don't know of a worse sin than that. I think it's the, one of the greatest sins of all time, maybe the greatest of all time, next to Judas betraying Jesus. But Peter did this as, as, as the Lord's, as an apostle of Jesus, a believer, and yet Peter's with the Lord today. In fact, Peter rebounded from that terrible failure and became a spiritually mature believer. He has eternal security. Why? We all do. Because we weren't saved on the merits of ourselves. We're saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we, if we could do anything to lose our salvation, then that means we weren't saved on the basis of the merits of Christ, but our own merits. And the Bible says emphatically we're not saved on our own merits, but on the merits of Christ. Look at it says in Ephesians chapter 2. Hurry. Wrap this up. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Very famous passage, right? We know it. Do you know what it means? Verse 8. Ephesians 2.8. And I wish, you, I wish you all could read Greek here. The Greek is emphatic. You have been saved by grace. You have been saved by grace. For by grace you've been saved. And have been saved is a paraphrastic, perfect, participle. Something, and it means that it's emphatically that you were saved with results that go on forever. Eternal security. For you have been saved through faith in Jesus, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Meaning, you're not on your saved on your own merits. For not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. If we got into heaven, based upon what we've done, or who we are, as unbelievers, we could boast before God. But nobody's going to boast before God. Why? Because we're all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 and 3.10. So we have eternal security, because when we said, Jesus, I'm trusting in you as my Savior, that's an acknowledgement that you're a sinner and that you need him. It's a submission to the will of God. And right at that moment, you're declared justified. You have peace with God. Look at Romans chapter 5. 
Look at Romans 5, back up a little bit. Look at Romans 5.1. Justified means you're accepted into God's family in Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified, accepted into God's family, declared righteous, by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus, we have peace with God. We got saved on the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. So what in the world could you do after salvation, after conversion, which could cause you to lose your salvation? Not even murder could stop it. Does that mean you won't get disciplined for murder? Does that mean God condones murder? No. But if you think you could lose your salvation for committing murder, that means you don't understand what happened at the cross. Did Jesus die for every sin in history, past, present, and future? By every person in history, past, present, and future? Yes. That's including murder. That's including adultery. That, all the sins you want to talk about. Homosexuality, lesbian, lesbianism. He died for all of that. So the sin issue is not an issue right now for the human race. It's what do you think of Christ? Do you believe in him? And if you have, you can rest assured it's a trustworthy statement as Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.13, 2, uh, if we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he can never deny himself. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us, encourage us, rebuke us, and prove us if necessary, instruct us in righteousness. And we pray that the Spirit would work mightily through your people and that this lesson would bear fruit in their lives. We know that it's the Spirit who bears fruit, godly fruit, and we pray that he would do a mighty work through your people and bring glory to yourself, Father, in the process. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.